And what next for the United Kingdom after the Scottish referendum? And I think whether people have particular ties to Scotland or not, Hong Kong was absolutely riveted, I think, like the rest of the world, as to the referendum in Scotland and what would happen. And maybe even after the vote, there's still an intense curiosity about where Scotland is headed and what all of this means for the United Kingdom. So we're very lucky today to welcome the Deputy Vice Chancellor of the University of Edinburgh. Professor Charlie Jeffrey is a political scientist with a passion for the issue of centralization, and as he said at lunch, a distrust of centralization and all that it means. He will be uh, answering questions after his speech, and I'd like to welcome him to the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Tara. What, what a great program of events that you have. I'm, I'm rather humbled that so many of you have come to hear about Scotland alongside all those, uh, those other things. Um, uh, we have emerged just from a, a most remarkable uh, period. Um, you'll see on my title slide the two titans in our constitutional debate, Alex Salmond, uh, the first minister of Scotland still for a few more days. Uh, and uh, David Cameron, the UK Prime Minister, Alex Salmond leading the uh, charge for independence, David Cameron trying to halt uh, that uh, charge. Uh, and then we saw the outcome of that titanic uh, battle uh, on the 18th of September. We had the question before us, should Scotland be an independent country? Uh, and in the end, over 55% voted no. Uh, just 44.7% yes. Uh, we counted the votes by uh, local authority area in Scotland, and only four out of 32 local authorities ended up voting yes. Interestingly, those that did uh, were in uh, industrial cities, Glasgow and Dundee in particular, uh, where the Labour Party and not the pro-independent Scottish National Party had been strong. I'll come back to that point in a moment. We had our question, should Scotland be an independent country? We voted uh, quite clearly no in the end. Only four out of 32 local authority areas voted yes. Those were in industrial cities where the uh, pro-independence party traditionally hadn't been uh, strong. Um, but overall, a, a clear no vote. Uh, both sides, David Cameron uh, and Alex Salmond, had agreed to abide by uh, the result. Uh, and Alex Salmond had said before the referendum that if it was a no vote, the question wouldn't be asked again for a generation. This was a once-in-a-generation issue. So we have a very clear outcome, a once-in-a-generation issue, so that's that then. Uh, or that would be a shame, uh, given that I've got 20 minutes to fill. <laughs> Um, I think we should rather see the referendum result um, as the, the end of the beginning of something rather than the end of a constitutional debate. Uh, and that's not to call the result into question, as some on the, the pro-independence side have done, uh, but to make the point that as one question was closed off by the result, uh, a whole host of other ones opened up. Uh, and I've been talking in various places about a constitutional chain uh, reaction. Uh, and as with uh, physical chain reactions, like the one on this slide, uh, they can be unstable and unpredictable in their uh, outcomes. Now, the starting point of our constitutional chain reaction was that opinion poll, an opinion poll published uh, on the 5th of September, 13 days before the referendum, by uh, one of our most reputed pollsters, which had the yes side for the first time in the lead at 51 to 49. Others around that weekend uh, also showed that the race was uh, neck uh, and neck, and the result was, frankly, panic on the pro-union side. You can see here uh, perhaps why. Uh, this is a graph uh, showing a rolling average of opinion polls over the 18 months or so before the referendum, and you can see it, it closed very, very suddenly to a neck and neck uh, race. 
Uh, and that uh, led us to uh, phase two in the chain reaction, uh, which was about more powers for the Scottish Parliament within the UK. Uh, in the preceding months, the, the pro-union parties, Conservative, Labour and Liberal Democrats, had each proposed separate uh, schemes for additional devolution with some common ground, some differences, but in a rather half-hearted way, and they'd half-heartedly said, well, yeah, we'll put this to the voters in the next uh, UK uh, election. Uh, all of that was changed by those opinion polls. Um, three days after the, the 51 to 49 poll, the former Prime Minister Gordon Brown, uh, supported by David Cameron and the other party leaders, firmed up the commitment to deliver additional devolution with a very, very clear timetable. By the end of November, that is in a, in a couple of weeks' time, there, will be, there would be a white paper um, with proposals for additional devolution. By the end of January, there would be draft legislation presented to the UK Parliament, and that would be debated by the middle of March in full plenary session uh, prior to the next UK election. On the 16th of September, all of that was underlined in what has become known as the vow. Uh, after the, the front page of the, the Daily Record, um, one of Scotland's most popular newspapers, uh, which uh, had the three UK-level party leaders saying, amongst other things, the Scottish Parliament uh, will have extensive new powers. They will be delivered by the process and to the timetable agreed and announced by our three parties, starting on the day after uh, the referendum. Uh, that turned the, the meaning of a no vote uh, into something quite different. It was now vote no and get more. Uh, and that had some effect uh, in delivering the no victory. What you can see here is the very, very final of these rolling averages of opinion polls. And you can see uh, the two sides getting further apart, and they continue through that into the final uh, result. And that takes us to phase three in the chain reaction. Uh, on uh, at breakfast time on the 19th of September, David Cameron surprised everybody when he acknowledged the victory of the no side by not only reiterating the vow about more devolution for Scotland, but also surprising people by saying, OK, it's time for England. And this is what he said. I have long believed, well, he'd shown no sign of it beforehand, I have to say, I have long believed that a crucial part missing from this national discussion is England. We've heard the voice of Scotland, and now the millions of voices of England must be heard. The question of English votes for English laws requires a decisive answer. English votes for English laws has become known as evil. So Cameron, Cameron is an advocate of evil. Uh, which is uh, an adaptation of procedure in the House of Commons so that Scottish MPs, and in principle those from Wales and Northern Ireland, would have a limited or even no say in laws that have to do with England only. In the same way, of course, that English MPs have no say over laws passed by the Scottish Parliament or the Welsh Assembly. So that takes us into the third phase of the chain reaction. So what... Uh, next. What next, firstly, in Scotland? Well, the commission uh, promised by the pro-union parties was set up immediately, uh, and it's now underway. Um, uh, the political parties all gave their thoughts to it by early October. There's a wider consultation period that's come to a close, uh, and there are now cross-party talks which will conclude by the end of November, producing some kind of, uh, of scheme of additional uh, devolution. So the vow has been upheld. But what's interesting is what's happening in the background. Uh, and in the background, the Scottish National Party, the pro-independence party, defeated in its main objective, uh, has seen an extraordinary growth in its membership. It has more than tripled in size since the referendum. It is now the third biggest party in the UK after Labour and the Conservatives. This for a political party which competes only in 10% of the UK. It's an extraordinary change. Uh, and its support has grown in particular in those yes voting areas, those industrial cities which used to vote uh, for the Labour Party. 
which takes us to Labour. Now, in the Commission looking at further devolution, Labour has put forward by some way the most cautious proposals, and the SNP uh, by some way the most radical proposals. And that's produced a gravitational pull away from Labour, looking as if it's going to isolate uh, Labour and throwing Labour into crisis. Uh, its leader in Scotland has quit. Um, Labour is now in a leadership contest in Scotland. Uh, and the opinion polls are looking absolutely dire. You probably can't see the figures there, but this is one recently which showed for the Westminster election next year, the SNP on 52% in Scotland, Labour down on 23% in Scotland. If that were carried through, Labour would emerge from that election with one seat at Westminster. Uh, in Scotland, uh, the SNP with uh, 50 odd. Probably won't be like that, but you can see that there's a, a rather strange feel to politics in Scotland at the moment. The SNP lost the referendum, but is now looking like the, the, the driving dynamic force in Scottish politics. It's looking like the winner. Uh, Labour is in turmoil and looking like uh, a loser. What next for England? Um, why did David Cameron start advocating evil all of a sudden? Now, there are three reasons for that, I think. Uh, the first is uh, it piles on additional pressure onto Labour. Now, evil would limit the, the role of MPs uh, from Scotland in the decision-making of the UK Parliament. Labour currently uh, delivers about 42 of them, I think. Uh, Labour is weaker in England. Evil would make it much harder for Labour to win a stable UK-wide majority and rather easier for the Conservatives uh, to do so. Uh, so the Conservatives are quite keen for that reason. Labour is not keen. But in not being keen, it runs the danger of appearing to be anti-English um, and uh, provoking the ire of the English electorate. So Labour doubly in trouble. Second reason... Uh, for uh, advocating evil. Uh, I think the least important reason for David Cameron, uh, and that is it's what people in England appear to want. Uh, there is genuine dissatisfaction in England with the way the UK political system deals with England, uh, and evil uh, has emerged by some way as the most favoured option for dealing with that. So the English appear to want special uh, measures uh, in the UK Parliament uh, for English matters. Third reason why Cameron uh, has suddenly turned to support evil is that it's a tactical ploy to shore up his party's right flank against the challenge of UKIP, the UK Independence Party. The UK Independence Party is a populist party on the right. Uh, it mobilises strong anti-EU sentiment, anti-immigration sentiment too, uh, a focus on traditional cultural uh, values, um, shares something, I guess, with the, the US Tea Party in, in, in various of those things. Uh, it has a leader, Nigel Farage, you can see on the left of the picture here, who is uh, a very able uh, communicator, um, uh, cultivates uh, a man on the street image uh, for somebody privately educated and from a stockbroking uh, background. It's a, it's a fine achievement on his part. Uh, and here you see him with Douglas Carswell. Douglas Carswell, a Conservative MP who resigned from the Conservatives, joined UKIP, fought a by-election and won. Now that um, suggests some of the damage that UKIP could do uh, in England. We've done some research on the makeup of the party's supporters. They identify themselves as English as opposed to British by a ratio of two to one. About 90% of them favour evil, uh, English votes on English laws. Close to half of them uh, are former Conservative uh, voters. Another MP has since defected. There's a by-election next week which UKIP is expected to win. I wouldn't be surprised if there were more defections. Now, if you ask, as we have done, uh, which political leader best stands up for the interests of England, we have a clear number one. Well, not a very clear number one, actually. We have a number one. Nigel Farage, 22%. We don't have a clear number two. Uh, number two is none of the above. 
So you can see there, 43% of people in England are already looking beyond the establishment uh, for somebody to advocate their interests. Number three, don't know. So that takes us to 60% uh, not inclined to seek uh, advocates within the establishment. Then poor old David Cameron limps in in fourth place and Ed Miliband uh, in fifth. Uh, so it is no surprise that Nigel is looking uh, so happy and treating himself to a pint of beer as he generally seems to do. Now, Nigel's happiness is, I think, uh, one of the, if not the main reason, why David Cameron has converted to evil. It's centrally about meeting uh, the, UK, U, the UKIP uh, threat. Now, where does this leave UK politics? Well, we are, we are now in pre-election mode. We have our general election in early May next uh, year. Uh, and that election is perhaps more uncertain in its outcome than any election in living memory. Neither of the two big parties, Labour and Conservative, are looking in, in great shape. Labour really should win. Uh, it's uh, competing against a weak government. Uh, the economic situation is, is not brilliant, and it's certainly not a a situation in which ordinary people feel that there's a recovery underway. The electoral system favours Labour very considerably, uh, but Labour's looking in terrible shape. It's under that challenge from the SNP in Scotland, uh, the SNP invigorated by its referendum defeat, and it's under challenge uh, in England over the evil uh, question. But then the Conservatives don't really look as if they're able to take advantage. They are under pressure from UKIP. Other MP defections are likely, and most likely around controversies within uh, the right wing of, of UK politics uh, around the European uh, Union. Which brings us to the question of our other referendum. Uh, that is the one proposed on the UK's EU uh, membership and perhaps phase four of our constitutional chain reaction. Now, UKIP is unambiguously for the UK's withdrawal from the EU. And this too is a big threat to the Conservative Party because many Conservative MPs are also for withdrawal and most Conservative voters are for the UK's withdrawal from the EU. And what we've seen as UKIP has risen in prominence at the Conservative Party's expense is a toughening of David Cameron's line on Europe. You may remember that right at the start of 2013, uh, Cameron gave a, a speech committing the UK to a referendum on EU membership in 2017 should the Conservatives win. In that speech, he was actually very strongly pro-EU suggesting that, yeah, we need to renego renegotiate some of the terms on membership, but we really want to stay in. Now, David Cameron appears to be seeking to renegotiate terms, especially on the free movement uh, of Labour, which are likely to be non-negotiable for other EU member states. Uh, and it raises the prospect that Cameron will not be able to uh, offer a positive case in campaigning for EU uh, membership. And what's interesting here is that Europe is not an issue which just divides uh, political parties. It also divides different parts of the UK. Some of the survey work I and colleagues have done show this uh, quite clearly. Here you see uh, answers to the question about whether EU membership is a good thing or a bad thing for the UK split by country within the UK. You can see that England and Wales are, are more or less evenly split on the issue. The Scots clearly think it's rather a good thing. And you see a similar pattern if you ask the EU referendum question. Would you want to stay in? Would you want to leave? Well, the English are marginally out, the Welsh marginally in, and the Scots clearly uh, in. Now, those figures, if you exclude the don't knows and if you weight by population, would produce an overall outcome UK-wide around about 50-50, but with England and Scotland in different camps. So with those figures, we would either be looking at a vote to continue in membership in which a slim English out was outweighed by a decisive Scottish in, or a vote to leave 
in which English weight of numbers dragged uh, uh, Scotland out of the EU against its will. Now, neither outcome would be likely to settle the question of how best to accommodate the UK's different nations in a shared union. I started out by quoting Alex Salmon saying that there could be no second independence referendum in a generation. But political time uh, has a different pace than everyday time. Uh, let me remind you of what Harold Wilson, uh, Labour Prime Minister in the 60s and 70s, once said. Uh, and that was that a week was a long time in politics. And if a week is a long time in politics, we can probably cram a generation into a couple of years quite comfortably. And with that, I think, I don't think the, uh, the constitutional chain reaction is yet over. It may well be that the European question uh, is one which divides England from Scotland and brings us back into that question of whether England and Scotland can share the same state. Thank you very much, Tara. Thank you very much. And I thought politics in the United States was in trouble. <laughs> it's clearly catching on. We have plenty of time for Q&A. There are mics around the room. So if you'd like to raise your hand, tell us where you're from, uh, we can get started. So who'd like to go first? Right back here on the veranda. Hi, I'm David McFarlane from Asia Asset Management. I uh, just wanted to ask you, you know, recent polls have showed that um, the SNP and people in favour of independence are, are now back in front. You know, 52% it seems to be at the moment, you know. Do you see this um, increasing as we go on? You know, as these people who made the pledges renege on their promises and do you see uh, another uh, vote taking place within the next two years to five years? That's uh, difficult to judge at the moment. Um, it, is, it is quite clear that the SNP is on a roll, um, and it's quite clear that's, that's rather surprising after having lost uh, the referendum. I think what we'll see as the, the Commission advocating additional devolution reports is that that will not be good enough for the SNP. Uh, whatever it delivers, even if it's quite a radical uh, outcome, which I doubt, um, it will still fall short of that aspiration, which is ultimately for independence. That raises the question of, of who the people are uh, who have joined the SNP. It shot up from a membership of 25,000 to a membership of 80,000. Uh, they seem to be people who were hitherto marginalized from politics. They're not ex-Labour supporters necessarily. Uh, they're people who just didn't give a damn. They do now. Uh, they were activated and energized by the referendum debate. They are not used to the disciplines of party membership. They came from loosely organized pro-independence groupings away from the official campaign. Uh, and it may well be that that energy um, does push the Scottish National Party into a vigorous position uh, in asserting its constitutional preferences and in, uh, in making the case that what the other parties are delivering is indeed a failure to, uh, to respond to all of those promises given before the referendum. I doubt whether that will lead to a new referendum in a couple of years, except if we have uh, some other external prompt for it. And I do think that the EU question could provide us uh, with that prompt, because it does show quite clearly that, that on that matter, as on uh, plenty of other matters, Scotland is different to England. Uh, and if you want to have the two places in the same state, then something which is as divisive as that and also as fundamental as EU membership could well be a trigger for um, another Scottish referendum. We'll start over here and go back to the veranda. Professor, welcome to Hong Kong. Uh, my name is Nick Green. I'm former chairman of the Conservative Party in Hong Kong. So I was very interested to hear your thoughts on UKIP in terms of how you see uh, the current wave 
of momentum across the UK actually uh, transposing into the general election at the next, next year. My own personal feeling, having just come back from the Houses of Parliament, um, is that actually uh, there is a very strong protest across the UK uh, with regards to things like UK immigration and our long-term membership of the EU. But ultimately, uh, I am very much of the belief that when it comes to the next election, people will look at UKIP, they will look at UKIP as a one-person party under the leadership of Nigel Farage, but they will also realise there's no depth to that party. And whilst the party the UKIP has momentum at the moment, I don't think that's going to materialise in the next election. So therefore, I think we will get another Conservative Party majority. I'd like to hear your views on that, please. Thank you, yeah. Uh, UKIP is an extraordinarily flaky political party. Um, it, it has a, a very able communicator as its uh, leader in Nigel Farage. Uh, David Cameron once described UKIP as a party full of loonies, fruitcakes, and closet racists. He was right. Uh, and you could add to that uh, misogynists, homophobes, and, and practically every other thing that you do not look for uh, in politics. However, people are really quite annoyed with uh, conventional politics. I agree UKIP is, is essentially a, a, a protest vote, but it, it is capturing, it's capturing a demographic. It's capturing a demographic which is uh, older, um, not the oldest, but people um, beginning to think of re retirement and perhaps uncertain about their standard of living in retirement. Uh, it's getting them from particular areas of, of the country, which are generally um, on the periphery of prosperity rather than uh, enjoying uh, prosperity. Uh, it's effectively picking up that coalition of support that Margaret Thatcher created for the Conservative Party, working class conservatives, people who bought their council houses who, who may have dipped into the share market and are finding that the world isn't quite as, uh, as was presented to them uh, back then. Uh, polls currently have UKIP on about 20% uh, in, in England. They're utterly marginal in Scotland, by the way. They're running about 2 or 3%. I doubt whether that will be the case at the general election, but I doubt it will be below 10%. And 10% could do an awful lot of damage to conservatives in marginal seats. I suspect UKIP has the potential to win only about five seats, if that. I suspect it has the potential to deny the conservatives a lot more seats uh, than, than that. Whether that's enough to deny the Conservatives a majority depends a bit on Ed Miliband. Um, I think the Conservatives are, are quite fortunate to have him as the leader <laughs> of, of the opposition. Um, and it may well be that Labour's currently low levels of support ebb away uh, and make a Conservative majority possible. I suspect we will not have a majority, though. I suspect we will have another hung parliament uh, with some configuration, probably a minority government, either Conservative or, or Labour. I don't see a majority happening very easily. I'd just like to jump in briefly with a question before we go to the veranda. And you talking about demographics. Uh, here in Hong Kong, obviously, we're seeing a younger generation suddenly very involved and very passionate about politics. Is Scotland and also the view uh, about the EU across the United Kingdom, is there a, a driving force by younger people these days? Are they becoming quite active? As a general theme, I'd probably say no. Uh, younger people typically are not attracted to conventional politics, to conventional political parties, to representative processes. They are very much engaged. Uh, they're politically aware and politically concerned, but express that in different ways. A comment there, though, on, on the Scottish referendum, which um, for the first time ever enfranchised 16 to 17-year-olds uh, and produced, I think, a, a really strong mobilization among that group and probably among younger people more generally uh, in, in Scotland. But it could well be that Scotland has re-engaged or engaged uh, younger voters in a way that hasn't happened 
uh, in the wider UK yet. Insofar as young people vote, and we've seen them vote in good numbers in Scotland in the referendum, we'll wait to see if that happens in a general election, they tend to be pro-European. Uh, they don't like insularity. Um, the, the big question is whether they can be mobilized uh, to express that view. Um, typically, the, the age group which turns out the most is the oldest age group, pensioners. Uh, and they typically tend to be rather um, hostile to the European Union. So you need an awful lot of young verve uh, to, to counteract um, the conservatism of old age. Uh, and if, if we had, instead of enfranchising younger people in the Scottish election, uh, if we had disenfranchised 55s and over, uh, Scotland would have voted yes. Um, so there is a, there is a, a real sense of, um, uh, a real conservative impact, I think, on the Scottish issue as well as uh, a hostility on the EU issue, which may well be much more definitive for UK politics than whatever young people think. Out to the veranda. Hello. Uh, Gavin Yur from the uh, Hong Kong Polytechnic University. You uh, referred to the increase in the SNP membership, uh, taking members mostly, I think you said, from the industrial areas, people who were previously not engaged in politics and came from social movements. Um, does this presage a, a movement to the left by the SNP? And if so, um, bearing in mind that 28 out of 32 local council areas voted no, but also that most of those, I believe, return SNP MSPs to Holyrood, where is that likely to leave the SNP come the next Holyrood election? And where do people who are perhaps just left of centre or are right of centre, as the SNP does move further to the left, where do they go, given that the uh, Scottish Labour Party, the Lib Dems and the Conservatives seem not to have reacted, yeah. responded vigorously to the SNP sure. challenge? Uh, your, your question gives me an opportunity to, to give uh, uh, some sucker, at least, to the, uh, the, the chair of the Hong Kong uh, Conservatives, um, because I do think the, the situation you've outlined opens up space for the Conservative Party in Scotland, where it's not had that space. Um, the SNP is, is clearly, I think, in the coming years, likely to emphasise its left-of-centre identity. It also has a, a right of center identity and has been quite adept at playing both. Alex Salmond in particular um, was uh, a very much a pro-business leader, but he's on his way out. His replacement, Nicola Sturgeon, has a, a, a clearer uh, identity on the left. Uh, her political roots are in the west of Scotland. Uh, she's an MSP uh, in a Glasgow uh, constituency. Uh, her instincts lie in a slightly different direction. And I think the, the influx of new members uh, is going to push uh, the SNP further into that direction. And I think the opportunity to um, perhaps replace the Labour Party as uh, the dominant party in the west of Scotland uh, will um, emphasise that, that drift uh, to the left which leaves opportunities elsewhere in the political spectrum. You're quite right to recall that 28 out of 32 local authority areas voted no. That includes all of those places in the northeast of Scotland where the Scottish National Party has had success both in Holyrood and in Westminster elections. Uh, I think the Conservative Party may well uh, sneak a couple of seats in the UK election next year in that part of Scotland, perhaps one or two more down in the south uh, as well, uh, and may well emerge as a stronger party uh, in the Scottish election in 2016. Uh, I think the Conservative Party is the one which has come out best on the anti-independent side. I think its leader, Ruth Davidson, has given uh, a different image uh, to the party. She's, she's young, she's gay, uh, she doesn't fit any of the usual stereotypes. She's a woman, uh, not 
typically a great strength of the Conservatives, excepting uh, Margaret Thatcher. Uh, and I think that's got a uh, brings an opportunity for the Conservatives to to sneak in where the SNP is likely to leave its right flank uh, a little bit unguarded. Over here. Uh, Peter Caldwell, um, I was fascinated by the statistics about the difference in support for the Union, European Union in Scotland compared with in other areas. Um, I'd be interested to know whether your research was done before or after the referendum, because it seems to me that the two might well be linked, that uh, if you were going to be independent and also out of the European Union, that might be a very different thing from being part of the United Kingdom and out of the European Union. I wonder if you would care to comment. Yeah, thanks for the question. The, the figures I quoted were from uh, survey work done in April uh, this year. Um, when we uh, fielded a survey at the same time with the same questions in those three different parts of the UK, we didn't manage Northern Ireland. Uh, and we did that because we had seen in our own work on England and in commercial opinion poll findings on Scotland and Wales, something like the pattern those, those data revealed, but nobody had ever done this research systematically. Um, with that in mind, I think there is a pattern which goes further back and is not simply shaped by the referendum context. Uh, we do have uh, another survey in the field at this moment uh, which is asking those questions uh, again. So um, if you give me your email address, I'll tell you what the results are when, when, we, uh, when we have them. Uh, I do think there's a difference there. Um, I think, especially in England, the EU question is something which has become visceral. Uh, it's about identity, it's about who governs us. There's a sense of, of England lacking voice uh, and casting its grievances onto the, uh, to the outside uh, force, perhaps in much the same way that Scotland cast its grievances onto the UK level, to Westminster, onto, onto England. Uh, I don't think there is anything equivalent in Scotland. What I, what I think you see in Scotland is a much more instrumental approach to Europe. I don't think it's huge, great Europhilia, huge, great enthusiasm for the European project. I think it's a calculation of cost and benefit uh, and a sense that actually the, the benefits outweigh the costs, so we'll, we'll have it. I don't think England is thinking in that way. I don't think England is thinking terribly rationally uh, about the European question. We have a question uh, on to my left. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Leslie Campbell. I am I'm working in finance here in Hong Kong, but I did write on personal finance for the mighty Daily Record for six years. My question is, uh, if we were to rerun the, um, the referendum, um, maybe three years uh, later, uh, so taking us further away from the financial crisis, or if the financial crisis hadn't happened, what do you think the result would be? And if I can add in a, a, a sneaky second one there, looking at Nigel Farage and uh, Marine Le Pen, for example, in France, how are these movements uh, linked up to the economy, and how do you think they will change maybe moving forward for two, three years? I think the... We, we had a referendum by accident, more or less. Um, the Scottish National Party has always wanted to have a referendum. It never had the opportunity because it didn't have a majority. It won an accidental majority in 2011. It wasn't expected. The electoral system had actually been designed so that uh, a majority would be extraordinarily hard uh, to win. But a, a mix of factors. Um, conspired to produce an overall majority for the SNP on 45% uh, of, of the vote. And I think that means that the SNP had to have a referendum at a timing which wasn't ideal. Uh, and I've certainly spoken to SNP insiders who felt that it was always going to be difficult to win at a time of economic difficulty and that if there had been a, a more stable economic environment, then the likelihood of winning would have been significantly higher. 
Uh, and I think it was clear during the referendum campaign that the biggest weakness on the yes side was uh, a sense of economic uncertainty, which was ruthlessly exploited by uh, the other side. Now, if that sense of economic uncertainty that, that, that the no side conjured up had less credibility, then I think we would have voted yes. It was very, very clear in all the survey work done by my colleagues and others that the biggest single correlation with whether or not people intended to vote yes or no was their sense of the economic future. Economic optimists about independence voted yes. Economic pessimists voted no. There were more of them. If we'd been in a better economic period, that may not have been the same calculation. We have time for one last question, and I know there was a hand raised on the veranda, the curious veranda there's, today. There's several out there on yes. the veranda. Yeah, I'll uh, yield to a local lady. Oh, thank you. Uh, Carmen Chung, National Press, a journalist, a professional member. Uh, thank you for your talk, sir. Um, I just want to ask one simple question. What do we expect the state for England and Scotland? how do we define the state? Because in that case, um, in my opinion, we may understand no matter when the referendum take place in Scotland, next time, it doesn't matter. But what do we, ex we expect for the state, for England and Scotland? Thank you. I, I, I suspect, uh, and I've, I've written um, in this direction, that the UK is in a process of slow disintegration, uh, which um, is unlikely to be stopped. I think that's unlikely to be stopped for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is that uh, people in Scotland increasingly see uh, their, their political future in Scottish terms. Uh, even if within the UK they clearly want the Scottish Parliament to be a more powerful Parliament, to have the predominant role um, in uh, taxing and uh, spending also on areas like welfare, which are currently held at the UK level. Uh, they want a, a discrete political system in Scotland. And I think there are signs that people in England want something uh, similar. So in a sense, there is, there is less of a common project that unites people in England and Scotland. Second reason is that the, the UK central government um, is, is not set up to manage territorial difficulties uh, in any kind of systematic way. Uh, we have never had the equivalent um, of other states with decentralized political systems in a department at the center responsible for coordination and for holding things uh, uh, together. Uh, and in fact, I think the only thing that really holds the UK together at the central level uh, is Her Majesty's Treasury, the Finance Ministry, which still holds the purse strings. But the current debate in Scotland uh, the current discussion about additional devolution is in particular about tax devolution, which of course means a loosening of the hold of the, the UK uh, finance ministry. So I think we're probably seeing at the moment the erosion of possibly the last thing at the center which really holds the UK together. That may not mean I'm suggesting that uh, we will have a set of independent states. I think we will see an ever looser form of union, uh, something like a confederal system of government emerging uh, by, by improvisation and accident uh, over the coming uh, years. So much food for thought, and I'm sorry that we couldn't get to everybody's questions today. Uh, Professor Charlie Jeffrey, thank you very much for coming. And uh, a small gift from the FCC. We do hope you'll come and enjoy a pint with us. We don't need to take a political photo uh, of you for any political party, but we'd love to have you back at the club. Thank you very much. <laughs>